اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي بعث في الامين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم اياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وان كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين he it is who raised among the inhabitants of Mecca an apostle from among themselves, who recites to them his communications and purifies them and teaches them the book and the wisdom, although they were before certainly in clear error. Brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh and welcome to the Life Faith Book. We would like to take this opportunity to send our condolences to the Hujja of our time and also to yourselves on the Istishhad, the death and the martyrdom of the holy seal of prophets Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi and inshallah on today's show we will be discussing a little more on Rasulullah and a little more on this hikmah that he brought to mankind his message and his wisdom and his purpose. Inshallah, we'll discuss this and much more on this speci special episode with Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panju. Salaamu Alaikum, Sheikh. Na. Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullah wa A'adhamala ujurana wa ujurakum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us and increase our grief uh, upon the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sheikh. Na. It with the ayah that I recited was from Surah Al-Jumma, it was the second ayah and it was discussing uh, the, you know, the, the previous ayah discusses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then it, the second ayah discusses how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed an apostle from among themselves right. and it was to guide them, to, to reveal to them the book and, and the, the word that, I, you know, that really touched me was the hikmah. Shaykh, what is this hikmah? Where, where does this come from? What, what, what is its purpose? Of course. Um, when you begin and you delve into the discussion of understanding the purpose behind the appointment and the sending of messengers by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for what purpose were the prophets sent to mankind? And the simple answer that can be given to you is that the prophets were sent to guide mankind towards truth to remove them from the darkness of ignorance and bring them to the light of guidance you could say in short another simple answer that the prophets were sent by mankind in order to guide them towards the religion of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a short answer that can be given to you but when you look into the short answer it becomes important for us to dissect this answer and to understand the methodology behind this. How is it that a person is guided towards Islam? How is it that the Prophet guided the people towards Tawheed, towards Deen? You find that there is a methodology and this methodology is outlined as you rightly stated within Surah Al-Jumu'ah. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyyina rasoolam minhum yatlu alayhim ayatih wa yuzakihim wa yuallimuhumul kitaba wal hikmah wa in kanu min qablu lafi dalalim mubin. You find over here that there are four major points that show us the methodology if not the chronology in how the prophets came and guided, in particular Rasulullah guided the people and the ultimate goal of Risalah. Number one, Number one, he recites upon them his signs, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, invokes the intellect to ponder over the reality of their creation and the reality of their creator. Ayatih awayya the dhamir ha refers back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yatlu alayhim ayati wa yuzakihim. When you ponder over the existence of Allah azza wa jal 
and your existence and you think about the purpose of your creation, the next very step is tazkiyah, where you zakihim. Tazkiyah to nafs, perfections of the morals. وَمَا بُعِثْتُ إِلَّا لِأُتَمِّمُ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was not sent except to perfect the moral of mankind. And therefore you find over here that morality is the center part of the religion. Ba'ad, in addition to this, وَيُزَكِّهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ He teaches them the Qur'an. He gives to them. He explains to them the treasures and applies the treasures within the Qur'an. And over here, بَيْنَ الْكَوْسَيْنِ between brackets, there are treasures of ma'rifah for a person who is seeking self-development and religiosity. In that before we delve into sciences of the Qur'an and sciences of the religion, Ya Habibi, the prerequisite is tazkiyah to nafs. If you have not cleaned your nafs from traits such as jealousy and selfishness and backbiting, and love for the dunya, then you cannot truly, in its essential form, benefit from the Qur'an. That information remove, remains as information. It's not converted into knowledge. The prerequisite is that a person purifies his heart in that sense. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ For you find over here that the consequence of your belief in Allah, pondering on the signs and being convinced on the existence of your Lord and the perfection of your morals and your learning of the Quran and the teachings within the Quran, living your life by the principles within the Quran, the natija and the consequence is hikmah, wisdom. Wisdom is gained through the Quran pondering over the teachings of the Qur'an, living your life, tatbik as per the values of the Qur'an, and in addition to purifying the nafs from every sort of evil traits, a person who has evil within his soul, who has not purified his nafs, he cannot see goodness for others except for himself. Such a person cannot attain wisdom. And you find that Allah Azza wa Jal very eloquently demonstrates this methodology with which the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to reform mankind. Reformation of mankind, reformation of the nafs, the key to religiosity is based on these four aspects of, uh, of Risala, the methodology of Risala as outlined within Suratul Jum'ah. Ascent, mashallah, Shaykhna. Shaykhna, I believe you brought some books with you today. Inshallah, we're going to be discussing and, and going through some. Would you care to explain what have you brought with yourself today? Ascent, um, keeping in line with the eye of the Quran, uh, which you stated at the beginning, hikmah in terms of wisdom. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, left behind for us treasures of wisdom such that if these words were embarked upon and if these words were to be studied and implemented we would be able to reform ourselves and we would be deserving to call ourselves the followers of Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad followers of Rasulullah and Muslims in essence so I wanted for tonight in honor of the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet for the first segment of the show to discuss certain words of wisdom that the Prophet of Islam has left behind for us that need contemplation and implementation particularly for us in this day and age and one of the books that I wanted to refer to keeping in mind the theme of this show has been the live faith book the live Indeed. faith book and um, over these months of Shahrum Muharram and Safar, we've been focusing on a number of texts, yes, Kamilu yes, Ziyarat and so on and so forth. So today for Istishan Rasulullah, the book which I want to refer back to is entitled Mawsu'atul Kalimat, the Encyclopedia of Words, Words of Wisdom. And uh, this is the particular uh, third uh, edition or volume number three 
entitled Kalimatul Rasulul A'adham, the words and the sayings of Rasulul A'adham, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And this encyclopedia was been authored by Al-Shaheed Ayatullah Sayyid Hassan Al-Shirazi, the uh, martyr. Uh, brother of the current Marja, Ayatollah Al-Uthma Sayyid Sadiq Al-Shirazi, brother to the Marja of the past, Ayatollah Muhammad Al-Shirazi. Ayatollah Shaheed Hassan Al-Shirazi was uh, assassinated mm -hmm. by the Ba'athist party um, on his way from Syria to Lebanon, yes. where he was going for a Majlis Fatiha. Shaheed Hassan Al-Shirazi, Ayatollah Rahmatullah Alayh, is the founder of the first uh, Hawza Ilmiya in yes. Sayyida Zainab, yes. known as, famously known as the Hawza Zainabiya. Yes. And he played a central role in developing the village mm -hmm. of Sayyida Zainab into a thriving city within the suburbs or a thriving part of the suburbs of mm -hmm. Damascus. So he has authored uh, an entire encyclopedia where he has collected words of wisdoms uh, starting from Rasulullah all the way down to the 12th Imam and words and words of wisdom from the companions, from the fawatim, uh, the, uh, you can say the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of Hadith al-Qudsi. It's an encyclopedia which is truly uh, filled with knowledge. One of the parts that I wanted to reference over here for us to seek lesson from the lives of life of Rasulullah and enlighten our souls from this wisdom which the Quran talks about that the Prophet came with. This is a part of an advice that the Holy Prophet gave to Abu Dhar, a wasiya, testimony, words of advice that Rasulullah gave to Abu Dhar. And he says to him in a part of it, Ya Abu Dhar, أعبد الله كأنك تراه. Worship Allah as if you can see Him. فإن كنت لا تراه فإنه يراك. If you cannot see your God, know that indeed your Lord can see you. And over here, this is very important for us to understand this. How can Rasulullah say to Abu Dhar, worship Allah? As if you can see Allah. Uh, the Prophet spent the entire Risala disproving Tajseem, disproving yes. the fact that Allah has a body. Yes. So how can you see him if Allah has a body? He can't be seen. He's not constrained by time. He's not constrained by space. What is meant over here? What is meant over here? Like the way Amir Mu'minin alayhi salam, who is Nafsun Nabi, when he was asked the same thing, he said, I've never worshipped a God I've never seen. They said, then you can see your Lord. He says to him, Yes, but not with your eyes, with your heart. Meaning that Rasulullah is saying to Abu Dhar, when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worship him with that full conviction. You can see him through your heart. Yani the existence of Allah is absolutely manifest from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to feel his presence. فَإِن كُنْتَ لَا تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ And even if you don't have that level, that intensity of that belief inside of you, it's sufficient for, for you to know that He is looking over you. Before every word I utter, before any person I sit with, any action that I want to do, just this two seconds of taraju, this two seconds of going back and just reminding myself that there is a Lord watching over me and that I'm accountable for my actions. You find that we would be able to eradicate and eliminate maybe 90% of the social problems that we Indeed. suffer today as a community if only Indeed. this one sentence from Rasulullah was taken on board. You find another one over here. Ya, he continues, Ya Abadar, ikhtanim khamsan kabla khamsa. He says, Abadar, take advantage of five things before you lose these five things. Yani five things that can never come back. He says, number one, your youth before your old age. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of your youth before your old age. Take advantage of the days where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you 
bodily strength, physical strength, mental strength, when you have the ability to work tirelessly and benefit from the power and the energy within your body to attain for yourself all those things of the dunya and the akhirah, most importantly the akhirah before your old age. Why? Because once this period of youth is lost, once a person lives through these ages, at an old age there is nothing but regret. You see, today you sit with a 50, 60, 70 year old person. You ask them, how was your time as a youth? How were your days as a teenager? He will sit back and he will tell you, my life passed like the blink of an eye. If only I could have those days of my youth back. If only I could have my teenage days back. I could have built myself a life. Could have built myself my dunya and my akhirah. These are the best times of a person's life, from his teenage years up to the age of, say, 40, for example. Yes. A person, this kuwa that he has inside of himself, the potential energy and the power, when the person is young in his youth, he's, he doesn't know the meaning of the word fear, <laughs> lives without fear of consequences. In a way that's positive, in a way that's negative. But... If it is used in a positive manner, they are still not entrenched into the ugliness of politics. Politics, what I mean is in any communal politics. Yes. When they work, they work lilla in the best of ways. Mm -hmm. and in my and this is a general rule. It's unfortunate you even find the youth in this day and age who are probably more evil than those elder than them when it comes to being malicious and so on and so forth. May Allah guide each and every one of us Indeed. and protect us from such traits. But you find the way here. Rasulullah gives these words, do not leave your life to be a life of regret at old age. Achieve everything you want to achieve in your younger days, in your youth, because this is a period once it's lost, it's not gained back. And this is an important thing for us youth to understand particularly when you come and you look at the issues of uh, unemployment, for example, lack of motivation studying, going to university, lack of motivation in learning the religion, participating in the religion. Yeah, if these are things that are not done within the youth. These are not done within your teenage years, within the years where you have the most power. When are they going to be done? person builds his dunya during this time, but it's more important that he also builds his akhirah during this time. وَالصِّحَّتُكَ kabla And your health before your sickness. So long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you health, so long as you are in the best of health, bodily and mentally take advantage of that to build your akhirah because once sickness comes in that health cannot be recovered yes. today alhamdulillah we are able bodied we have hands we have legs you have legs you have power you are youth take this advantage to walk to karbala because at an old age you don't know if you will have that physical power to walk to karbala Indeed. In your young age, you have the ability to sleep two or three hours in a day and still function at full force. Spend the nights in ibadat, in salatul layl, in weeping for ahlul bayt, in upholding the majalish, in performing azadari. Why? Because when you come at that older age, God forbid if you are struck by illness. How many people suffer from some sort of paralysis. They're paralyzed. They're not able to serve Allah. Right, Look at yes. the regret. Yes. Some of the people, one of the elders, once I was speaking with them, they were saying to me, my biggest regret with uh, uh, the, the, the disease or the sickness that is for the joints, mm -hmm. the knees, the name just skips my mind right now. Okay. He says, I couldn't, I'm not able to perform sajda. Mm. So when I pray, I pray while seating. While I'm seated, I do sajda because I can't bend down. 
He says, I miss and I wish before I had this sickness of the knees and the joints, I wish I spent longer hours in sujood. Why? He says, now I can't do it. He says, these younger people, these people have been given good health. They don't realize what they have been given. Take advantage of your well-being and your health before sickness comes in. وَغِنَاكَ قَبْلَ فَقْرِكَ Take advantage of your wealth before poverty kicks in. Ya Akhi, today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted you with wealth. Use this time where your wealth is here now to serve Allah, to spend in the way of Allah, to spend in charity, to spend in the building of mosques and Husseiniyat and funding majalis and funding the calls of Imam al Hussein and Rasulullah, publication of books. Why? Today you have the wealth, Baba. Tomorrow you may not have the wealth. Nobody can predict the future. Even the best financial analyst cannot guarantee you exactly. that the wealth that you have today, you will have it tomorrow. Today I've got money saved aside in my bank account. Yes, you have to take care of the future. And yes, you have to plan for a rainy day. But you have to live in the moment. Rasulullah says, live in the moment when you have spent in the way. Because how many people have we seen who lived a life of wealth and richness and then dropped into poverty Indeed. and they wish that they would have given this sadaqah and this charity that is there. By the way, charity increases sustenance, not okay. decreases it. And then you have over here, he says, وَفَرَاغُكَ قَبْلَ شغلك. Take advantage of your free time before you are engulfed and encompassed by responsibilities such that you don't have any free time. Free time. How we use our free time? Time management. This time that I use watching television, this time that I use in useless talks and conversations on social media and useless times I spend loitering around the malls and the train stations. Ya Akhi shall not benefit you neither in the dunya nor in the akhirah. On this before we end for the break. Taking advantage of free time, minimizing dead space. Even the time that you're on the tube, commune, commuting to work or coming back, even that amount of dead time, I need to use it either seeking knowledge or dhikr or refinement of the nafs. I give you an example before we end. One of the ulama, if I'm not missing, marajat taklid, name skips my mind. One of the marajat taklid. He was coming in for his bath al kharij and like every marjat taklid, they have got a number of responsibilities. This incident is actually mentioned uh, by uh, his eminence, Atullah al-Udma Sayyid Sadiq al-Shirazi. says that marjat taklid has got million and one things to do, management of the entire ummah, management of the marja'iyya, distribution of funds, answering questions, istifta'at, his own studies, and, 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 mashallah. In addition to that, bath al-kharij teaching. This particular marjan taklid was a little bit late coming to class, five minutes, seven minutes. And it happened a couple of times. One of his students went up to him and he said to him, Sayyid, you are a marjat taklid and you don't have any respect for time. Every day you come late for the bath al kharij, five minutes late, seven minutes late, ten minutes late. You're wasting the time of the talaba. At least come to your class on time, don't waste our time. In one way, look at the concern. Not to say that this student, the manner in which he approached was wrong, but I'm saying just look at the way the Talabi thinks. Even this five, seven minutes for me is crucial. I'm not going to waste it mm -hmm. in jack nonsense here and there. Mm -hmm. Marja Taklid said to him, what do you do this between these five, seven minutes that I'm late? He says, we're waiting for you. This Marja Taklid said, when I used to wait for my teacher, when he was late in Ba'thul Kharij, these five minutes, seven minutes, I used to remove my Quran. 
I used to read and I used to memorize. Over the entire year, these five, five, seven minute time slots that are there, I managed to memorize an entire juz of the Quran, if not more than that. So a person taking from the words of Rasulullah, I sit back and I see how much time do I waste in a day, dead space or dead time, which if had I taken advantage of it, I would have made gains and leaps in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. Time management from the lessons of Rasulullah. Inshallah, the, the brothers and sisters that are watching can use this break. Uh, and take advantage of the break and maybe memorize a little bit of Quran, inshallah. Uh, we'll see you after the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the live Facebook. Um, Sheikhna, you know, Safar is a very, very uh, special month for us Shia. And um, it is a month where obviously there is a lot of grief, a lot of mourning. We have Arba'in, uh, we have many, many, uh, you know, uh, deaths on the way. For example, Imam Sajjad, uh, Sayyid Al Qayyah. Um, and then we come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who is arguably the center point of the whole religion, who is the most important figure when it comes to the 14 infallibles. Um, right now, it seems as if it is only the Shia that are wearing black. And Rasulullah is a universal figure for all Muslims. Um, I mean, don't, don't you think this is a bit strange that this is only the Shia that are commemorating his death? Um, it's strange. And um, you don't know whether to laugh or to cry from a number of fronts. And to a certain extent, you could say it is extremely hypocritical of a nation and a group of people who claim to be followers and lovers of the Holy Prophet of Islam, yet on the martyrdom anniversary of this Holy Prophet, you find them in a mode of celebration and laughing and enjoyment and every sort of entertainment perceivable to the human mind the Muslims are engaged in it. Today is the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet of Islam, this one person who reformed the entire world, who is the focus of respect and pride for the entire Muslim Ummah. This Muslim Ummah that apparently doesn't even tolerate caricatures of the Holy Prophet in foreign newspapers. Where are you when it comes to your grief and paying tribute to the Prophet of Islam on the night of his martyrdom? And it is as if he just doesn't exist. And there's a number of reasons for this. You have the general public, to a great extent, that is just ignorant. They've not been taught. They've, nev they've not been taught. They don't know any better. We can't blame them. And this is where you and I come into the picture in regards to our tabligh. This is where the television channel comes in, to, in, its, in respect to its responsibility, not only Qanat uh, Imam al Hussein, but every other Shia channel that is out there, every other Muslim channel that is out there to come and shed light on the Hurma, on the divinity and the sanctity of this day, which is the martyrdom of Rasulullah, for the entire Muslim Ummah to pay tribute to their leader and their master. Majority of the people don't know. You can't blame them. They need to be educated with love, with wisdom, tabligh and tabligh and tabligh. And then you have those who are the more deviant, more cunning, those who hide the truth, 
having known the truth, the people at the, at, at the top and the deviant and the corrupt. Today, 28th of Safar, you can imagine that how many Muslims do we have in the world, Sayyid Muhsin? Rough ex estimate? I think that's like one billion. A billion Muslims. From a billion Muslims, how many countries claim to be Muslim countries? Very few. Within the Middle East and here and there, say, number of handful countries that yeah. claim to be Muslim in North Africa, mm -hmm. in the Middle East, yes. in the subcontinent. Yes. From these countries, hand on heart and a question for the Mushahideen. Just for us to see where is our loyalty and how true are we in our claim towards Islam. Which country even had their flag at half mast in honor for the Shahada of Rasulullah? Which Muslim country today had one minute silence in honor of the greatest man to have walked this earth? Leave the outsiders. Baba, look at our own. Today when you come and you look at the non-Muslims, which events they have that are much less significant than the istishad of Rasulullah, you find that there's a level of respect for that history. I believe this weekend is Remem Remembrance Day as well. This weekend. Remembrance Day. Yeah. Ahsan, everyone is wearing the Poppies and stuff. Yeah. Poppies and stuff. Some sort of affiliation, commemoration. What? It has been drilled into the mind of the Ummah that to revere that individual who is responsible for your eternal salvation is bid'ah and shirk. And this is the key that we're talking about. The root issue of the problems within the Muslim Ummah. Every type of problem that we face today. Ideological problem, social problem, political problem is because we abandon the teachings of Rasulullah as is. Nobody comes and tells us, oh, the colonialists had power over the Muslims and the colonialists are conquer and divide. Baba, why did the colonial get to that position where he can rule over the Muslims? Because the Muslims themselves abandoned Rasulullah and abandoned the teachings of the Quran. We have to be honest. We have to be frank. We have to be truthful to ourselves. This is the blatant truth. Whether we like it, we don't like it. We can decide to live a life of a lie. And it's very easy to blame everyone for everything. But we have to look at ourselves. Even within the Shia Ummah. What are we doing in regards to the Shahada of Rasulullah? To shed light on the life of Rasulullah, the teachings of Rasulullah for ourselves. How much, how accurately have we understood the Holy Prophet of Islam? Have we understood him as per the Quran, as per the teachings of Ahlul Bayt? Lola. How much of his teachings are being implemented within our life? Tabligh and tabligh and tabligh. This is where our responsibility comes in. In the same manner that Rasulullah did with love and with wisdom and with akhlaq. Ahsan, Sheikh Ahsan. Sheikh, you were discussing about, you know, finding the truth and, 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 you know, accepting the truth within ourselves. What is the truth in regards to the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? And within the Muslim Ummah, there, uh, there's many, many different narrations. Could you please just, you know, discuss a little and, and, and let the viewers know the Shia stance on how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was, was martyred? This is a discussion in itself which perhaps needs an entire program and uh, inshallah in the near future we can have a program where we can have references and textual mm -hmm. evidence but and to understand as well why a lot of these realities have been kept hidden but there is absolutely no doubt yani number one from Quranic indications Quranic indications as well as from the hadith that the Prophet did not die a natural death. The Prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal was far too high. He was far too much elevated. He was elevated to a higher level than to die a natural death. Indeed. He died a martyr. The question over here is who poisoned him? Some are of the opinion that this was the effect of the poison 
that was given to him after the battle of Khaybar by the Jewish lady with the poisoned meat. And this is easily refutable um, on the basis that we have traditions where the Prophet didn't eat from that poisoned uh, piece of meat. Uh, number two, even if he did eat it, science is still to show us a poison that is consumed three years or four years before and then takes its time to uh, manifest effect, its yes. effects and there was no trace or no sign of a sickness or complaint from Rasulullah but mysteriously four years later this poison that you ingested suddenly starts to take effect. Mm. We have sufficient proof and this is the bitter truth and reality. We have sufficient proof from within the books of the Khassa and the Amma that indicate that the two wives of Rasulullah, Aisha and Hafsa, were responsible for poisoning Rasulullah. And there are hadith from Ahlul Bayt. And when you look at the entire issue in its when you look at the issue in its entirety, keeping in mind the manner in which Rasulullah was forcefully fed this unknown substance as per the attestation of the books from the Mukhalifin and how he was refused the paper and the pen and as soon as his soul left his body the Saqifa takes place and the rights of Amir al-Mu'mineen are usurped and you look at everything in its entirety you put the pieces of the puzzle together like in a jigsaw evidence is very clear for anybody who has a free soul a discussion and an analysis that is free of any politics and purely textual and ideological this is the only conclusion that can be arrived to Sheikh, now you've got another book with yourself uh, i believe you're going to be discussing a little bit about rasulullah's final moments um, Care to discuss the book uh, before we go into um, the actual event? The book um, that we also, I highly encourage, this has been encouraged by Imma of Ahlul Bayt, Imam Sajjad, I believe. Imam Sajjad, Imam Bakir, mm -hmm. and Imam As Sadiq, mm -hmm. Salawatullahi wa Salamahu alayhim ajma'een. And this is Kitab Sulaim bin Kays al Hilali. One of the most ancient books of Shia literature that has reached us today. Kitab Sulaim bin Kays al Hilali. I believe that this book is also translated into English. It is available in English. And uh, I know that um, uh, one of our learned scholars is going to be presenting very soon on uh, Imam Hussein TV in regards to the authenticity of the book Kitab mm -hmm. Sulaim bin Kays al Hilali. There's a lot of, uh, you can say, confusion and a lot Indeed. of controversy Indeed. in regards to the authenticity of the book. And inshallah, uh, Samahat al Sheikh will be dealing with this and uh, with his knowledge and uh, with the collection of evidence from all the uh, ulama of the past and the present. He's able to put that misconception to bed. Inshallah. Kitab Sulaim bin Kays al Hilali is an important book for each and every one of us to be familiar with in order to understand, number one, the gravity and the magnitude of the events that took place upon the martyrdom of Rasulullah, the extent of the dhulm and the extent of the oppression that Ahlul Bayt and their immediate followers went through upon the martyrdom of Rasulullah. So, for example, within Kitab Sulaim, you have an entire account of what happened in Saqifa as yes. per the words of uh, Salman, okay. for example. And then you have Qadaya as Saqifa ala lisan al Bara'a ibn Azib. So, Bara'a ibn Azib gives his account of what happened in Saqifa. You have the account of Saqifa by Salman al Muhammadi. And then you have how Amirul Mu'mineen came forward to give uh, his hujja. You have narrations on the Shahada of Sayyida Fatima al Zahra, for example. And uh, you know, 
uh, how hadith were fabricated, who fabricated the hadith, how Amir al Mu'mineen was taken to the masjid, all these things is mentioned in Kitab Sulaim. If I'm not mistaken, there's a tradition by our sixth Imam that states that the one who has not read or does not have Kitab Sulaim mm -hmm. does not know anything of the secrets of Ali Muhammad. The secrets of Ali Muhammad. For you to understand the extent of oppression your Ahlul Bayt went through in order for you to have a deen today. You have over here the chapter that is Kalamun Nabi Fillahdatil في اللحظة الأخيرة من عمره المبارك. The words uttered by Rasulullah during the final moments of his blessed life. يا أخي مسلم شيعة. What were the last things your Prophet said? What were the last conversations your Prophet had before his ruh left his body? This is narrated by Sulaim. Kala Sulaim Sameatu Salman. I heard from Salman saying that I was seated. I will translate real quick. I was seated by Rasulullah in his last moments. Fadakhalat Fatima alayha salam. Zahra alayhi salam came in and when she saw the Holy Prophet and the state of the weakness in which he was and the pain in which he was When she saw Rasulullah in this weak state, in a state of pain she was overcome with tears and the tears started rolling down her cheeks so Rasulullah says, Ya Bunaya, he says to her, Oh my daughter, my abkik, this is what makes you cry. Look at what Sayyidah Zahra said at that moment. She said, Ya Rasulullah, Akhsha ala nafsi wa waladi. Adhaya min ba'dik. Ya Rasulullah, by looking at you, I fear over myself and my children and the manner in which we're going to be persecuted after you. How our rights will be taken away after you say the Zahra is weeping because the doors of tragedy will open upon them with the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet. He says over here, Fakala Rasulullah Salman is narrating. Wa igrawrakat aynahu biddumu. Rasulullah is replying now back to say the Fatima al Zahra. He says, and his eyes were filled with tears. He was crying. Rasulullah was crying. And look at how Rasulullah gives this, this taslia, this comfort to say the Fatima al Zahra. How he prepares her for this looming tragedy that is going to fall upon them. He says, Ya Fatima, awama alimti inna ahla bayt. اختار لنا الآخرة على الدنيا. So Fatima, remember, Allah has chosen us for the hereafter rather than the dunya. You are all the trials and the tribulations of the dunya. You will face in order for this akhirah. And this conversation goes on between Rasulullah and Sayyidah Zahra. And the time is almost up. How, many, how much time do we have? We have about two, three minutes. As this conversation goes on between Rasulullah and Sayyidah Zahra, and then you find the way here, Rasulullah then says, the hadith then goes on to say, ثُمَّ نَذَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَى فَاتِمَةً وَإِلَى بَعْلِهَا وَإِلَى إِبْنَيْهَا فَقَالْ He looked at her husband and the children, yani Amir and Hassanayn. And then he said, يَا سَلْمَانْ أُشْهِدُ اللَّهِ أَنِّي حَرْبٌ لِمَنْ حَارَبَهُمْ وَسِلْمٌ لِمَنْ سَالَمَهُمْ أَمَا إِنَّهُمْ مَعِي فِي الْجَنَّةِ O Salman, bear witness. May Allah bear witness. I am at war with those who are at war with them. And I am at peace with those who are at peace with them. Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein. And then it says that the Prophet turned towards Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he said to him, Ya Ali, 
You are going to face after me tragedies from Quraysh and oppression from Quraysh. فَإِنْ وَجَدْتَ أَعْوَانًا عَلَيْهِمْ فَجَاهِدْهُمْ وَقَاتِلْ مَنْ خَالَفَكَ بِمَنْ وَافَقَكَ She says, if you find supporters, Ya Ali, if you find supporters, then take your right and claim your right from those who have usurped it from you. وَإِنْ لَمْ تَجِدْ أَعْوَانًا People ask, why was Amir al-Mu'mineen silent for his right? Why did he not stand up? He was following the wasiyah of Rasulullah. If you found supporters, who was there to support Amir al-Mu'mineen? No. Apart from five. He says, and if you didn't find any supporters, Ya Ali, Fasbir, then have patience. فَإِنَّكَ مِنِّي بِمَنْزِلَةِ هَارُونَ مِنْ مُوسَى You are in the same position to me as Harun was to Musa. And this is the important point. وَلَكَ بِحَارُونَ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ And you have a perfect model of emulation within Harun. Yani Harun is your role model, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Adapt the same stance that Harun adapted. إِنَّهُ قَالَ لِأَخِي مُوسَى إِنَّ الْكَوْمْ إِسْتَدْعَفُونِي وَقَادُوا يَقْتُلُونَنِي Harun, when Nabi Musa went up to the mountains and he left Harun in charge and Samiri came and built the golden calf, the people overpowered him. Could Harun do anything? Harun didn't have any supporters, so he remained patient. And in the same way, Amir al muminin command from Rasulullah, which is a command from Allah, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَىٰ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ And this is how Rasulullah these are the words and the messages that he uttered at the final moment of his life. And the Qissa Mufassala, the entire maktal of Rasulullah. If Allah Azza wa Jal gives us another opportunity, we can discuss this in detail. Inshallah. Next time. Shaykh, thank you very much for tonight's discussion. And thank you to all the viewers for joining us. Inshallah, we'll be back again same time next week for a new discussion on Aqaid on the live Facebook. Inshallah. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.